I think society is just not being informing people. Uh, and partly it, there are voices out there that are lying. And that's clear mm-hmm. uh, with their own agendas because they think the environment's more important or they, uh, whatever the reasons are. Uh, not everybody in those camps, but some are. But there's also a, a society we've just let this go on challenge that, oh, okay, maybe there are too many people and maybe we can have kids in the 30s and maybe I should just let my kids lead their career and, you know, see what see what happens. But when you tell young people about this, there's shock and horror. Like, what do you mean I might end up childless? So uh, I, I, I therefore am quite hopeful that this somewhat uh, can and will change. Hello, everybody. You are listening or watching Chatting with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Horback. Before we jump into the intro, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. It helps with all the things. It helps you not miss an episode. It helps me with visibility and growing the podcast. So like and subscribe. This week, we have Stephen J. Shaw joining the podcast. Stephen is a computer engineer, a data scientist, and he started his first documentary, Birth Gap, which is Uh, tackling the very concerning issue of global decline in birth rates. And when I found that out, I was really shocked because I had always heard overpopulation, 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 and quite to the contrary, the issue is actual population collapse. So this is a very, very big problem that no one is talking about. We're going to find out why. His work is incredible. I will link all of the resources below. The documentary is available on YouTube and his website. Again, all of that will be below, so definitely check that out. It is worth watching. And without further ado, please help me welcome Stephen Shaw. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It is very late your time. It's early my time, and I'm glad we can make this happen. Me too. So I've been just like delving into your work and I I love how I kind of came across it. I think it was it was like global overpopulation day or something was the holiday and it was one of those kind of like propagandized meme channels that was kind of perpetuating this really popular narrative that there are too many people and it was talking about the climate disaster and how people should be having less kids and it's irresponsible and then I tagged Chris Williamson and then you got we I either tagged you or he tagged you and I was like this is a topic I've been wanting to get into for a really long time because I like a lot of people I think have I've been told a lie about what's happening with our population that's fair I think we all have for a very long time so I watched the conference that was in the beginning of your documentary with Jack Ma and Elon Musk. And at the time when they were talking about the predicted, like the biggest global crisis in 20 years is going to be population collapse. And I watched that at the time and I was like, what are they talking about? This goes counter to everything that we've been told, or at least my generation's been told. Why? And then in the documentary, it kind of like goes, it's backdated to these like really old interviews of news anchors also saying it. And it somehow went under the radar. So do you know, I guess, like, where did this idea of a population bomb become so popularized? And somehow, what seems to be the indisputable truth that it's actually the opposite was under the radar for so long? Yeah, um, as I think you know, I came into this as as a demographer um, in 2016, uh, shocked to see falling birth rates in almost every country in Europe. We all think about Japan, where I now happen to live and where I am tonight. But when I saw this is a global trend that started in the 70s and hasn't relented at all, it's just spread and spread and spread. It was shocking to me. So you're right, like, how do we have this idea that the world's population is growing on you know forever that's the image this impression i had mm-hmm. and you start to see when you're looking at data data is objective that the people who have controlled the narrative and i think it's a variety of reasons maybe some people think they're doing good by controlling the narrative maybe they think it's good to make us all believe that the world's going to you know explode in a bomb of population there has been growth but just to explain when you see that narrative has not changed since the 70s it's not objective it's a, a, a form of ideology and it's really easy to spot because when you take someone who, let's say, works for a so-called population organization, every time they draw a chart of 
population that usually starts in 1800, and then they do this line like this, and then they stop. That, that's all they do for effect. And when you look at the actual data, yes, sure, that's right. But then we know it's going to do this, and this is going to be mainly older people, older people, and then it's going to go down. And you realize they're only telling half of the story, the historical part of the story, and they're not updating their narrative. And as a data scientist, that's rather annoying because I want to debate with objective people. But what I've seen during the documentary and after making it is there's a lot of people out there clearly with their own agendas, whatever those are. And just on your point about people saying, we hear it all the time, there's too many people on the planet. That's intended to be a conversation closer. When people say that, or when people are taught to think that way, we're supposed to not think any more about the implications of population decline for countries like Japan and Europe and the US is, is, is on the same path. You know, in reality, come on, let's be serious. There's a change about to happen. It's already well underway in many countries. And we need to be talking about this, if nothing else. So for me, it's really calling out those people who have agendas and I, I, you know, what, what frankly pleases me is they seem to be rather upset that my documentaries come out just explaining the reality and the facts. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that uh, people start to realize the reality is that population is slowing and we're about to enter a very new world. So as you mentioned, you have been living in Japan and that's where you currently are. Why is it, why do they seem to be so far ahead of everyone else? Because I recently had this, this man show Niyamoto on and he's kind of like this spiritual influencer and he's um, based in Japan as well. And we were discussing how like the average age of a virgin male in Japan is 30 now. Like that is unprecedented. Um, people aren't getting married. People aren't having children. And there's, I don't know, it's weird because you have this culture that for so long seemed to be more advanced as far as like spirituality and connect connection and family and like ikigai purpose. And for some reason, it seems like it, they kind of got flipped on their head. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I think there's a lot written about the surface of this, meaning the top level facts like the average age of a virgin in Japan, but you really got to go so much deeper than that. I, I want to qualify one thing first, though. Uh, we all think, certainly I did, that Japan is the outlier or that Japan started first. That's yeah. not true at all. It actually started in Germany several years before Japan in the late 60s. And then Italy, Spain, many countries in Europe ca caught up at the same time of Japan, uh, same time as Japan in 1974. Uh, I, I don't know why we've come to think of Japan only. Uh, maybe it just fits a narrative that Japan's different or that perhaps you know, Europe has focused on some immigration to kind of offset this a little bit, which has not been very effective. The point is this is cross-culture. This is not about Japanese culture or not Korean culture or Italian or German culture. This is a global phenomenon. But to come to your specific point about sexlessness, uh, yes, it's certainly a, a thing here. I've met people, I've talked to people that, that are in that position, which I find quite incredible. But I think the same effect now has hit the U.S. I'm, I'm reading a lot about young people who are you know, voluntarily or otherwise you know, checking out of you know, the dating market or you know, just have given up on that. So it comes down to me to a case of, well, what's cause and what's effect? Mm -hmm. I, I think... Certainly what I see here is a situation where younger men in particular are being, uh, um, yeah, and some to some extent pushed out of the dating market. <laughs> Women's education is higher here, which is great. Education uh, Careers are, are, are equal right now. And I see absolutely women here going for more educated men and more educated, career successful people here. And I think this part of society just doesn't get a chance quite so much. I think men oftentimes are giving up, giving up on life, giving up in society and giving up on dating. Now, that's a huge topic in its own right. And I, I don't claim to be a complete expert on it, but I don't, for, I don't believe for a second that any country's birth rate is falling because of sexlessness. I think it's the other way around. You know, I think and it's clear this started in the early 70s here. And then we have these interesting, different, perhaps bizarre phenomenons coming after that. So do you, did you find a commonality that happened 
within like that time period of the 1970s because that was a really interesting part of the first part of the documentary is that it does seem to transcend culture and religion and country like there's not a lot of people might blame something like dating apps or social media or pornography or whatever like right we want to find like a, a silver bullet to this and when you see it a it started before a lot of these things if it was in the 70s so this is pre-internet and then if you have something that seems to be taking place in some place like Japan and the Middle East and also in America like there's vast difference in the way that we we approach life and culture and our belief system so it's like what happened in the 70s that seemed to permeate through all of these things and that's really where um you know the documentary starts as uh, uh, as you mentioned I I came here to research this I didn't know but no researcher had found a connection before uh, they'd found potential reasons within Japan. Japan it was blamed on work-life ba- balance in Japan. They mm-hmm. do work incredibly hard here, even today. In Italy and Spain, it was blamed on youth unemployment. So each country had its own potential causes. But for me, this happened at the same moment in time and has spread relentlessly. And what I mean by that, it's not like it was a wave that came into parts of Japan and then faded back and then kind of took off again. This hit Japan, rural and urban areas, well, I'll tell you, in the same month. This was July 74. And you can see every single prefecture in Japan, I think it's 46 at that time, 46 prefectures all had a sudden decline in uh, fertility rates and they declined from there. So it was a momentary thing. And that's wonderful you know, as a data scientist, because you can look at that and you can quantify that. And the probability of that happening natural, it's just astronomical. It's like tossing a coin 46 times and having heads turn up every single time. We see the same thing in Italy. We see the same thing anywhere we've got data, the same trends show up. So to answer your question, the oil shock happened in October 73. There was a huge crisis of escalating oil prices. I vaguely remember that as a small child, but I never came here thinking that would be connected. But what happened was Japan, as the world's biggest oil importer at that time, uh, went into a form of social panic. It's all over the historical media. You can see empty shelves, rising prices. And from that moment, there was a fall in birth rate. So that's interesting. So why was that? I really don't like talking about the average woman or the average birth rate because it really masks so many things. I think, you know, that's been one of the reasons we haven't really understood this trend because we tend to look at total fertility rate. No, we need to go deeper. And when you do that, you find that in that moment of time, so nine months after the oil shock, birth rates go go down. But who is it that that, that has experienced these lower, lower fertility? People with one child already actually accelerated having the second child for a year or two. I think that was people thinking this might get bad economically, that we should have the second child. We always wanted quite quickly. So that's interesting. Those with two, three, four plus all continued having the exact same number of children as they would have had anyway. Statistically, there was no change. The big change is that childlessness went from around 4% in Japan in 73. Within three years, it was up to 22%. And then it went up to 30%. I mean, this is an unprecedented demographic change of a mass number of young people deciding to defer parenthood. So instead of having a child at age 26, 27, very quickly, that was pushed into late 20s and early 30s. And guess what happens at that? You know, when you defer childbearing, not everybody who wants to have a child ends up having one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and why fertility is a factor, but actually the biggest reason is not being in a relationship at the right time with the right person or going through a divorce or a breakup. So we find that around you know one third of Japanese society starting then when delayed parenthood became a thing um, up to today are, are, are childless and 80 percent or perhaps more of those is what they call unplanned childlessness, people planning to have a child in their 30s. And then something goes wrong. You know, it's a it's a, a series of factors and people get more tired in their 30s. They have breakups. Finding a partner that matches is harder. That's Japan, which, um, you know, we I know a lot about because they got so much data. But you see the exact same trend in Europe at the same moment in time. So this is deferred parenthood through economic vulnerability. 
Yeah. And the frustrating part about that is I feel like women have been lied to for such a long time. And, you know, I think it was an overcorrection for trying to get women to have the right to be able to pursue a career and stuff and interests outside of the household. But we've been told, like, you can have it all. And we kind of know that everything has a trade off. Like, you can't have it all. Everything is like a give and a take. And, for a long time, it was that, and even now, if you still go on like social media, it's kind of perpetuated there. It's the myth of the biological clock. Like if you go on Reddit, that's an entire forum. And it's like, what do you mean that this is a myth? So we were told you can go and have your high power career and that you can postpone childbearing into your 30, like late 30s into your 40s and that there's no no payoff, that it's there's no risk, that you're just as fertile, that this is the patriarch. And then you listen to these fertility doctors and you're like, that's that is not the case. There is a cliff. And it the way that I was looking at it is that the fertility for a woman is kind of like an N. So you have like this really happy middle ground, which is usually into like your late twenties, early thirties, and then it quite literally is a cliff. Like it just it tanks. It's almost like a reverse hockey stick. So once you get into your late thirties, the quality of your eggs and just like the viability, it just, it, it drops. And then you, you'll, you can say, oh, well, there's these technologies like egg freezing. And I always thought that that was a super safe bet. Um, I was in my early twenties and I was single And I was like, well, you know, maybe that's like an option if I don't find the right guy at the right time. And I thought that the success rate was really high. And it turns out it's not at all. Like it's actually very, very rare to have like a successful egg freeze and let alone an embryo freeze and then that turn into a viable pregnancy. So I just think that we were told we can have it all. We can delay everything. Biology isn't real. You can be Demi Moore and have a baby in your 40s and you don't need a man. And I just don't think that that conversation is serving women because like you were mentioning, the data suggests that there's 80% of women that didn't plan on being childless and how devastating that has to be. Yeah. Uh, There's a lot of lying going on and it's coming from different corners, different voices. And again, to me as a data scientist, I'm just looking at data and I was expecting to have open objective dialogues of people who are saying different things and to hopefully have a dialogue or even enlighten people as to reality. But some people don't want to listen and some people are rather threatened by facts. In the documentary, well, first of all, I uh, traveled to 24 countries. I met 230 people. The majority were women. On my crew, we were nine people. That changed depending where we're filming, um, three, four at a time. But I was the only man. It was young women in particular who were drawn to this topic because they want to know, you know, what's going on in the world. And as young women, I, I think they were drawn to understand how the people balance work and careers. So, and you mentioned fertility doctors. I sat down for long interviews with five fertility doctors and they all said exactly what you're saying. And how the media distorts this, that usually when, I don't know about Demi Moore, I don't want to say, but usually when a celebrity gets pregnant, often it's an egg donor, so it's not their own egg, or it's an embryo frozen a long time ago. And, and embryos are you know, more likely to, to lead to success than, than egg freezing. But uh, And I see this even on Twitter, you know, even just you know, commenting on some of my own data or posting that you know, this is wrong, it's easy to have a child in their 30s. Here's a fact. And this is just a raw, simple fact. And this is for every industrialized nation and beyond, without exception. Uh, Well, there's one exception. I I beg your pardon. I'll come to that in a second. It's a small one. The probability of a woman without a child ever becoming a mother after age 30 is 50-50. At best, most countries, it's slower than that, 28, 29. So if you haven't had a child by 28, 29, maybe 30, it's 50-50 whether you ever will. The exception is Israel, where it's 31. It's one year uh, extended. When I asked people, I did an online quiz, uh, just out of interest, and the majority of people thought that was either 35 or 40. No one was really thinking 30. And this is a side of fertility windows. It's a side of any individual factor because there's so many factors. And the biggest one is simply not having up. So you're 33, you've done everything, you're ready but you just said breakup and it's going to take two more years to find the next boyfriend who you find doesn't want kids or the timing's off or you're getting tired. So there's a multitude of reasons why delaying things by definition is riskier. 
Um, and one point on the fertility woman, the NCP, yeah, I guess I see that, you're, you, that, that that's right, kind of a, it reaches a maximum and then goes down again. But uh, in the world of statistics, we talk about variance. And variance means that, well, not everybody's the same. So I think we all want to know what is the infertility you know, window for me? And we look at these average numbers. But for some women, it's much younger than others. Mm-hmm. Others, absolutely, it's later. We hear people successfully having a child into the 40s. It happens, but those are the exceptions, which is why we probably hear about them. So it's riskier. And for any individual, you can't know what your risks are, despite all the technologies. And I think for a reason like you, when I first heard of this, I actually thought, oh, this is great. This is a, a potential solution. And for some individuals, it will work. But the more... I've been talking to people. I realize that the, the kind of games we play with ourselves, I think there's a factor here that, oh, I've frozen my eggs now. I can keep working for another five years. I, I don't need to worry about this until I'm 40. And then it's way, you know, again, breakups come to play. And then the ability to carry a pregnancy full term deteriorates so rapidly. There's a chart in the documentary, but you know, after 33, 35, I mean, fetal loss, it's just going like this. Oof. Um, and that's for one child. You know, if you want two or three, like my, my, my gosh. So, you know, and this is harsh. You know, I've got two sons, I've got a daughter, and I support them equally in terms of their, you know, career and everything else. So this isn't easy to solve without society making it much more flexible for careers and education. But we can't be telling people, oh, it's okay. That's a lie. It's, it's not. Um, and, you know, so it, that, that, that irritates me greatly when I hear that. So it's around 33 or 35 when making it to full term becomes less likely. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's already going. I mean, the curve I'll do like this. It's kind of, you know, going early 30s, mid 30s. 40, and then by 50, it's, you know, having a child at 50, it's almost two-thirds likelihood you're going to lose a child, even if you were to get pregnant. You know, 45 is is, is way up there as well. So, you, you know, it's, it's so there's three factors here. It's the number of eggs, you know, the fertility doctors explained to me, including um, Dr. Andy Wang, who's Kim Kardashian's fertility doctor. He, he had this magic kind of way of describing how egg quality goes down from the age of 20, but also quantity. So you got the quantity of eggs reducing, the quality is deteriorating because a woman uh, is born with her eggs. You don't make more eggs. They're getting older with you. Mm-hmm. And then the ability to carry to term successfully. Um, so, you know, we can't say a single age because it varies by individual. But hard fact is by age 30, you have a 50-50 chance. And that's, well, apart from Israel where it's 31, that's universal. And that's so shocking because I feel like this is my anecdotal experience, just like talking with people in their 30s, late 20s, and then also in your documentary. There seems to be this universal self-doubt or I'm not ready yet. I can't imagine having a baby in my 20s, which (laughs) used to be very normal. And biologically speaking, that seems to be the ideal window to have a child. But we have this idea that we're not ready, we're not mature enough, that we are still ourselves somehow a child or developing. Or And I find that, I don't know, I found that to be really interesting. And then like this idea of, of control that seems to be there as well as people really, and I think this probably goes into the fertility um, options is people really want to have like a hyper sense of control on everything. Well, I'm going to have my career exactly right here. I'm going to have the perfect partner. And then I'm going to like flip on a switch and have a baby. And it's not that easy. And I think our parents would always say there's never a perfect time, right? There's never a perfect time. And they come to you and they come to you, but we are trying to like somehow fight that and have it all. And I don't know. I don't know where like that self-doubt came, almost like this failure to launch where we don't have that inner belief that we can bring a child into the world. Yeah, there's a lot there. And, you know, I agree with everything you're saying. You know, I think perhaps it's natural to delay childbearing to, you know, if it were the case, if it were that we can have whatever number of kids we want mid thirties, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. You know, maybe it'd be great uh, for many people to do all the things they want to do, but that's not the reality. Uh, What I've found the one 
optimistic thing, having made this documentary, is screening it to younger people and the reaction I'm getting from younger people, strong reactions. I can give you one. There's a student at Cambridge University, Charlie Bentley Astor, um, who uh, reached out to me. She actually invited me as a student to come and screen it there, but they canceled it because some people thought it would be uh, dangerous for women to learn about the idea of you know, having children. Oh my but that aside, Charlie's reaction herself uh, was one of anger. She's 24, um, and her belief from society was that she had 10 more years before even needing to start to think about settling down and having children. Mm-hmm. When she saw the facts from the documentary that it's 50-50 by age 30, first she described this period of anger you know, with society. Why had she been told this? Uh, because the reality, she had only five years to get established career-wise and everything else. And she came out with this phrase, I, I, I quote it a lot, but to me it's, it's so beautiful as an expression of how she felt. She was haunted by the future she might not have when she saw this, the realization that she may end up childless. And I mean, it's, it's a beautiful statement, but it's a chilling statement. And when I hear comments like that, that gives me optimism that younger people just armed with simple facts and the stories of other people who had wanted children and ended up childless. And, and frankly, are the, the term they, that that community uses grief, they're grieving the fact that they never had children. I think society is just not being informing people. And partly it, there are voices out there that are lying. And that's clear mm-hmm. uh, with their own agendas because they think the environment's more important or they, uh, whatever the reasons are. Uh, not everybody in those camps, but some are. But there's also a, a society we've just let this go on challenge that, oh, okay, maybe there are too many people and maybe we can have kids in the 30s and maybe I should just let my kids lead their career and, you know, see what see what happens. But when you tell young people about this, there's shock and horror. Like, what do you mean I might end up childless? So uh, I, I, I therefore am quite hopeful that this somewhat uh, can and will change. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too, because we, I think modeling is really important, right? Like exposure is really important. Otherwise we have, we make something a lot scarier than it might necessarily be. So that could be parenthood. Uh, That could also be aging. So when you don't have experience and seeing it firsthand and we kind of live in this bubble now that seems to be sanitized of humanity like you go out and it's just like this this happy easy group of people that you are exposed to on a daily basis you don't see a lot of elderly people you don't see a lot of children we make it very inconvenient for young families to go out it, we actually kind of expect them to stay home because i don't want to be bothered by your child you go to a bathroom and any public facility, I think this kind of like tells you how accepting we are of children. There's not one toilet that a child can reach. It makes no sense to me as a parent because we have these ADA rules where you have to have a wheelchair accessible bathroom. There are more children than there are people in wheelchairs. So why are we accommodating one group and not the other when there are more of the children? We went to Austin recently and we went to, I forget what restaurant, but They actually had like a tiny little urinal and my son was ecstatic. He like he (laughs) felt excited and welcome to be there. It's like, well, why isn't there one like put it in the wheelchair bathroom? There's plenty of space for you to just put one up there. You already had to spend the money to accommodate one group of people. And I think that's awesome, right? Like they need to be able to use the restroom too. But like, what about the kids? So we don't accommodate children in our daily lives at all. We like have all these subliminal messages that say you're actually not welcome here. Um, So then we have these young people that aren't exposed to like how to parent. There was a part of your documentary where you can like pretend to be a parent for a day so that you can make a decision. It's like, that's not even, that's not anything about what it is to be a parent. It's not your kid. It's not going to resonate with you, but like you need to have your family that is exposed like aunts and uncles and that kind of thing. And then when it comes to the elderly, it's the same thing. We want to push them off into homes because I don't want to be faced with my own mortality or my own death. So rather than face that fact, I'm going to shove it away into a corner and they can kind of take care of themselves, which is also not good. So it's like, how do we create a society that like welcomes all of it? 
Gosh, um, I'm loving the conversation because I, I, I'm just as worried about old people as I am about young people, particularly in regard to loneliness. And the documentary is part two, which isn't public yet. You know, we, we go to communities in Germany and Japan where older people are living alone and dying alone. Uh, and it's not pleasant at all when you hear about the last years of these people's lives. Well, and it's not just childless people. People say to me, oh, but people who have kids can be ignored too and can be mm-hmm. lonely too. I'm, I, no, no question. But being without family doesn't help. And, you know, I, I, can I share with you like one of the, the, the stories? And, Please. You know, in Germany, we went to a crematorium. And I was planning to interview the director. It was the largest crematorium in southwest Germany. And he refused to take the interview in the end when he understood a little bit about the questioning about people dying alone. But he talked to me on the phone separately. And um, I later found out the full story. So in Germany, people who are in homes, but without family, when they come to be cremated, they have an autopsy. And they are evidently malnourished. They have got marks on their wrists and ankles of having been bound in their beds for extended periods of time. And this only happens to people without family. And I mean, it's scandalous. I mean, someone needs to make a documentary about this. Uh, And in Japan, there's another scene, you know, I don't want to kind of upset too many people, but a a woman uh, aged 90 without children took her own life just through, through, through loneliness. And now I heard that this is happening on a regular basis. Now, those are extreme stories, perhaps, perhaps not, but it's indicative of all days loneliness. And you don't see loneliness by definition. It happens in the home. And you don't see those old people who are going out once a week to do their shopping. And the only conversation they're having is at the, you know, the cash checkout because they have nobody else to talk to. So, You're absolutely right. We need to solve all of these problems. We need to create more of an intergenerational society because all people have a role. They Mm -hmm. absolutely have a role, especially in terms of, you know, helping young parents, you know, with childcare, for example, when they're they're able or helping to to teach. I think older people could, could make tremendous teachers or helping with homeworks or whatever it is in the right context. But the idea that you retire and the dream that we might have is that it's great. I can watch you know, TV all day and I can play golf with my friends. That might happen to some people some of the time. But retirement is a very long thing for, for many people, luckily, I, I, I have to say. But I, I don't think we've got it right. I don't think we've got it right to kind of you know, just let people live their lives, their later lives alone and put them in care homes. Something's fundamentally wrong about that. So everything's wrong. Everything's wrong in how we've set up to kind of enable young parents to have children if they want them and to help people have better, you know, more healthy, you know, later lives. So. Yeah. It almost seems like to me that we we're like prioritizing pleasure and enjoyment and we don't want to take like we don't want to take all all of life we only want to take the bits that i don't know like serve us are enjoyable are postable like kind of throwing a lot of the responsibility away when i talk to a lot of women that are my age that don't have kids and are really struggling with that decision and not understanding that like again like they've already passed the peak but because they have the idea that they can go well into their 30s and it's the same. It's like, well, I enjoy my life now and I enjoy my Netflix with my boyfriend or my husband. I enjoy going out to the bars. I enjoy being able to travel. And it's like the story that they tell themselves is that children are going to ruin their life. And to me, like that's also kind of that is a lie because I'm like, I have two kids. We travel all of the time. We always have. Yeah, it's a it's very different traveling with kids than without that goes without saying your life changes entirely. But it's not worse. It's if anything, like they have created the most indescribable amount of value. And it's not to like push women that don't want kids to have kids, because if right. you don't want kids, you're going to make a terrible parent, right? Like a right. child deserves to be wanted in this right. life. So I think that goes without saying, but I'll say it anyways. It's more geared towards the women that don't have like a conscious decision, right? Like they're letting fear make that decision for them. So out of this 80% of women that 
didn't plan on being childless, when did it hit them that they they did want kids and kind of like past that tipping point? I think that can vary, but I just want to emphasize, you made the point, and I always try to do it as well, that those people, those women who don't want children, absolutely, they need absolute support because no one should be coerced into having a child if they do not want children. That that would be a horrendous society. Um, I have interviewed five women for the documentary who are in that position. They never had the desire for children. Mm-hmm. And they're you know late 30s up into 50s, and they had no regrets. They were living the life that they wanted to live, and no regrets. Clearly, that was the right decision for them. The sense I get, and this is opinion, but it's opinion based on interviewing a lot of people, is it seems to be pretty black or white. The idea that there's people in the middle that are thinking, well, if this happens, great, but if it doesn't happen, that's okay. Really, you know, maybe a few people indicated that, but once you get into conversations, it's like, oh, I just had a breakup two years ago, and I don't trust men anymore, and, you know, I I really want kids, but... You know, there's there's things going on. You know, so in other words, they do want kids, but they're kind of, it's being masked by other reasons. And if you think that you've got to late thirties, yeah, yeah, some do, but you never know. It's a huge risk to kind of put off this 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 idea that you know you can just you know wait a couple of years for the next boyfriend and or, or girlfriend or whatever whatever. So um, the, the whole idea of waiting. It's just a simple, huge risk for anybody doing it. But I just want to come back to to one thing on happiness. You mentioned earlier that people want to be kind of happier and, you know, go to the bar and take vacations and all of those things. There's a narrative out there um, that surveys have shown that childless people are happier. Um, I've heard many people tell me this because it's become like so commonplace to hear this. But if you look at those surveys, it's shocking. Uh, one had to be withdrawn because the researcher completely understood the, the data set he was looking at. Um, but the best example is one from uh, the, the British Open University. Uh, to mention briefly, it was 2013. It was a survey of couples. And it asked many things about couples' lives and happiness. And now, remember, this is couples. I, I want to come back to this. So it's not interviewing single people. or uh, It's couples. And they ask people, are you happier with your partner? Or are you happy with your partner? And it turned out that childless people are marginally happier with with their partner than people who have children. And that might be because children can be stressful sometimes. It might be because in the early days of having a young child, people really don't like their partner and then it kind of gets good again. So the average is off in some ways or that childless people break up more often. I don't know, but the research paper said it's a marginal difference. So the headlines were that childless people are happier. No, it actually said that childless people were happier with their partner, but it said something else that they skipped over. The happiest group of people overall by a significant margin were mothers. So you read this survey, who's the happiest group? Mothers. Was that published? No. And this made The Guardian and the BBC skipping over that. I mean, it's shocking in terms of any form of objective research or even journalism that you'd skip over the group that's happiest. You'd skip over the fact that this is a survey of people in a relationship and people who don't have kids and also are single, living alone, are probably much less happy. And you focus on a subset of a subset uh, and then twist the story completely. So it's back to, I mean, that's lies. That's nothing, not the researchers, because they didn't set it up that way, but the people interpreting it that way are are, are lying to people. That's shocking. And that's the tricky thing with data too. So as you said earlier in the episode, it's data is objective, but the interpretations are not. And I think that's where it gets really slippery because if you're someone that just reads a headline or you're following like some kind of propaganda channel, then you can see someone like twist and manipulate data to tell the story that they want to tell. I think I saw something with that study too, and it wasn't taking into account the whole trajectory of what parenthood is. So Mm -hmm. if you're just taking a snapshot of a newborn, that's very different than having, you know, a teenager or an adult child. And if you have to take the whole scope you can't just say parenthood right now right because it's yeah. very different like those are yeah. very different stories 100 percent. and i don't think we, i mean we don't measure happiness uh we don't use happiness 
uh, for anything else, I was trying to think, well, do you ask questions about people going on vacation, whether they're happy or not, if they went to Mexico or, or, or if they went to, I, I don't know, California or, or Miami or wherever? Like, you don't see things like that. that oh, come here. People are happy. Or happy. So why are people in this topic suddenly introducing happiness? It's only people with an agenda who are taking studies and twisting them who want to persuade younger people, oh, it's okay, you'll be happier. So what I've come to realize is that there are voices out there that are twisting everything around us. And it's and who are they affecting most? It's younger people. They're making younger people think, hey, you can wait. Hey, you're going to be happier. Don't worry about it until, oops, it's too late. Sorry you wanted a kid, but, you know, tough luck. And the message goes on decade after decade aimed at young people from school age education. I mean, this this data is in textbooks about the world's ever-growing population. Uh, there's organizations that are funded by donors who construct this information to create a narrative that gets into high school books. Mm. And they're poisoning young minds. It's, 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 it's nothing less than that. Yeah, there was this really good quote by Jordan Peterson and he was listing the lies that we have been telling young women. And one of them was that nothing is more important than your career. And I mean, I, I grew up with like the Spice Girls and girl power and right. Like that was the era that I grew up in. And it was, you don't need a man, you don't need marriage, you don't need a relationship. Like what you need to become is this high performing, powerful woman and then you will be fine. And I look back now and I'm like, there was such a time where I was living that narrative and I was miserable because I always knew I wanted kids, but for some reason that didn't seem good enough. Like that seemed like I was checking out and I wasn't participating and like you're just a mom was kind of how I felt. So I would deny that I would want kids because that almost seemed embarrassing for a long time. And it wasn't until I started to get like into my my mid twenties and like found my now husband where I was like, no, that is what I want. And that's beautiful. And that's not anything to be ashamed of. And that is a ton of work. So I kind of like had a flip of how I perceived like motherhood entirely. And it was against a lot of these pop culture narratives. Oh, I hear this a lot, you know, it's, um, and not everyone is as lucky or fortunate as, as you are, um, at all, uh, in the hardest interviews I did, uh, multiple interviews were with people who had one of children and it wasn't successful for the reason you stated, you know, they were focused on career. They didn't think it was important. They thought, you know, that it was more important to develop those things. And if motherhood happened or not, it wouldn't matter. But people find out later on very often, not everybody, but very often. Uh, and the number of women who were in tears and men too. Men don't talk about this anywhere near near as much, but there's a scene in part two of the documentary where there's nine men in a support group talking about this. I think it's probably the most chilling scene for me in the whole documentary, hearing men open up, saying that they cannot talk to anybody about how they feel. Uh, and just one comment on, on uh, one of the, the men uh, from, from that group, uh, Tim from Germany, he... Um, he and his uh, wife just gave up on IVF because IVF's not an easy thing. You know, those hormonal, hormonal treatments are, are tough and sometimes it's wor- it works, but you've got to expect to go in several cycles uh, before you, realistically it might work. Uh, some are lucky, but uh, Tim and his wife just gave up after I think more than 10 years of trying and wow. he was devastated. He, his comment to me uh, when he saw the first cut of the, the documentary, the kind of the draft, uh, you know, that I created, the, uh, the rough cut, uh, we hadn't updated the, the end cr- rolling credits. And he said, Stephen, can you please make sure my name's on the list because it might be the only thing left on earth after I die. That, that might be my legacy, that I'm part of your documentary. And it's, I've had so many heavy conversations. That's just one example with people. And um, for people listening here, I, I mean, we should say there are support groups. Like there's uh, Gateway Women, which is a great resource for childless women. Um, and through them, there, there are support groups that you can find for, for men too. And I'm always reminded by this community who I've come to feel close to because I support them so much because they're a voiceless group. You know, you don't have childless people, you know, forming public support groups and campaigning for things. that They're, they're grieving often in silence. 
but I am reminded that for, for, for there is hope for them that you know what they try and do is give back to society in different ways, and that you know for, for them it's not all over, and many do recover and you know to a reasonable extent. Uh, I should say that some feel that they do get over it, but you can see in the voices and the faces and the stories that it's been a hard, hard road to get to that point if they have indeed overcome it. So this is not a small thing. This is not like, you know, shucks, I wanted to be a, a doctor. Or I wanted to be, a, you know, a, a, an astronaut and it didn't work. You know, you, know, you get over that. Not having a child it, it is it's a form of grief. I don't think it ever truly leaves you. And that is something we need to be much, much, much more aware of. So it seems one of the, one of like the big, I'll say mistakes that young people are probably making is picking the wrong partner or like the sunken fa- uh, cost fallacy. So staying in a relationship that they know isn't right for them just because they've already done the time and they don't want to start all over again. And it's like denying very important parts of yourself and like what you want for your future because you feel like you, you'll you never find someone better or you're, you're not going to find a better match. And I think it's how do you date and and like try to find a mate more effectively and honestly and it's funny because you'll talk to some women and they feel like they can't have the conversation of do you want children on a date because it's too much too fast and you don't want to spook the guy away but there's plenty of men that do want children and they do want to build families and then if you're denying like if you're lying about what you want right like you want to be a mother and then you you might spend a lot of time with the wrong man and like that time is really precious so it's just a really good filtration process of like is this person my person or not and then to move on and continue trying to find your mate instead of investing a lot of time into the wrong person there was a young woman in your documentary I think it's like towards the end of part one and it showed her husband and she was like saying how she wants you know her husband's this great guy and she loves him but he's just not ready for kids and it showed him and I was like someone needs to tell her that is not the guy she's supposed to be with. And it, for me on the outside perspective, it just seemed so obvious that she had chosen poorly. And for some reason you don't see it. It's like the last person to, to discover water is a fish. So like you're just in too deep. Um, so how can we, how can we date more effectively? Like you're a parent. I'm sure you've probably had these conversations with your kids or like you try to guide them in such a way to make the best choices for themselves. Yeah, I do, but I try to at least. But it's, I mean, this is this is a huge, huge problem. And I can give you an example from about three hours ago. I was having a conversation with a young Japanese woman, 32. And uh, I've known her for a few years. I've known her boyfriend, who's a great guy for three years. They look like a great couple, but she's just told me that he has just told her he doesn't want kids. And she's just devastated after three years because they had talked about this. But it was never conclusive. I think she was just misinterpreting a little bit of his doubt, like not yet, not yet. But I th- it, when I heard that, it didn't completely surprise me. I think uh, we all need to ask ourselves this question, honestly, particularly men. Do you really want kids? And if you're dating someone, just as a man, you know, every monthly cycle, you know, a woman is losing an egg. And we need to be asking ourselves, are we being fair to this person? If a woman has said she wants kids and you're with her longer than six months, certainly a year, you are wasting her time and you may think you're having fun, but if she wants kids, she wants kids. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen situations where, you know, you, you have people who have never talked about this. I had one couple uh, who went through a breakup after seven years from 25 to 32, never once had they talked about kids. The young woman had assumed that it was good for life and, uh, of course, they'd want kids. And then he said, no, they don't want kids. And now she's single, now looking age 32 for another boyfriend, which is never particularly easy in today's world, certainly. It, uh, you know, so she might be 34 before she meets someone, let's say. That, that might be a, a, an outcome. And then probably she might want to get to know that person for a year or two or three, and there's 37. So men, uh, uh, the responsibilities on both here, I think women can be more honest than men. And men don't quite think about it the same way. We have this belief that we can have children anytime, so there's no rush, Mm. which is a fallacy. Technically, we can, but we're trying to find a partner who's able to have children. So we're, we're, we're competing with our younger selves 
to date the same pool of women who are able to have children. So I've also met many men who have, frankly, turning 40 uh, changes things. You know, they think suddenly they're ready, right? And trying to find what they're looking for at that stage, which might be a 30-year-old woman to three kids with. Well, 30-year-old women aren't going to be dating 40-year-old men, you know, unless you're kind of on a certain A-list in terms of income or, or, or you, know, you know, fame. So I hear a lot of stories and I'm asked to give advice, which is hard. Um, so many stories. Uh, another young woman uh, last week, uh, final one for now, she's dating someone who already was married, already had four kids, and she persuaded herself, uh, oh, that's okay, he's got four kids, I don't need kids. But now, mid-30s, she's realizing, wait a minute, I do want kids. It's not enough that he's got kids. Uh, and yet he's refusing the idea of more kids. And they're two, three years, I believe, into a relationship. Time lost. So we need to, not for a second, third, di- third date, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, earlier rather than later, there's no point wasting time for anyone here. See, I feel I, I don't know what I'm talking about because I have been with the same man for like 13 years. So I'm so far removed from current dating and what is a faux pas and what's acceptable but I feel like if I were in the dating pool right now it would be like that would be one of the first things I would have asked if I didn't have children especially at this age it's like I would be aware of the time and how crucial that was so it's like like if you haven't figured yourself out enough to where you know if you want kids or not or if that's triggering for you then that just shows a lack of certain maturity that I would want in a partner anyways um, it's not like, do you want them with me? Obviously you don't know that yet, but like, do you, is that something that you want for your future? I feel like I would go in deep fast and maybe that would backfire. I have no idea. I think, you know, frankly, we can help make that more the norm by encouraging people that it's okay to have that conversation mm-hmm. and don't be surprised if you're a man that that conversation is going to come up and be ready for an answer. I think just up to, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, this idea that women can have kids anytime they want you know what why are you going to talk about this when you're getting to know someone you know in in your 20s so i'm not so worried about this uh longer term because i I think as people become more aware of the reality of the fertility window being much shorter than than expected and how unplanned childlessness can can is a reality for 80 percent of of childless women i i do believe women will get a little bit it's feistier the right word in dating and a man will be put in the spot to kind of think about this and so yeah we need to be encouraging people as much as possible early in the, the dating cycle to, to to talk about this did you see um pod generation yet no no it's with amelia clark it's supposed to be satire we watched like half of it and i like the first half of it i'm just like yelling at the tv the whole time and my husband's like this is so annoying for multiple reasons so let's put something else on but it's supposed to be satire but it it feels eerily possible for that to be the future and it's like basically women stop having babies and all they're doing are like these pod babies so it's like this egg and like the egg like you you watch the egg get fertilized on this screen so you don't even have sex to get pregnant so you're watching it all happen on this screen and then they take that zygote put it into this egg turns into the embryo and then you can like put your hand and just like watch the baby in this shell and it's these women that are like they have a tablet and they're feeding the baby on the tablet and they're checking and they're very like neurotic in it. And it like, it's supposed to be out of convenience that you have this egg so that you don't miss any work, right? You can have your little pod egg and you can still be a high performer for your company. But what I'm seeing is that it's ends up being more work because you don't, you're not letting your body and nature just do what it does. Like I don't have to think to feed my baby in my belly. My body has the, this innate intelligence and is just doing it. I don't have to check through this like hollow screen to make sure that they're moving and wiggling. One of the questions in the movie was, how do I make sure my baby's not bored in the egg? <laughs> they're like, well, we can't have any bored babies. So you have all of these lights and music that you can play so they're, they're never bored. And I'm like, 
This is so insane. And let me guess, you've got to pay for the upgrade to get the lights and the music, you know. For sure, for sure. And it's like, how dystopian is this? And at the same time, you'll see these really alarming articles about artificial wombs and and getting to a place where you have babies that don't need a body. And I'm like, that is so the wrong direction. (laughs) That is so the wrong direction. Like Progress for progress is not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. And that's so far into the future, you know, uh, you know, when you look at the risk to a baby being in any form of artificial womb and the cost, it's not going to, I mean, I, I, I read, you know, maybe 50 years from now, that technology might be on the horizon. So it's not going to be a solution for any young people living today, frankly. So I think we can just discount that. Thank Someone God. said to me recently, and maybe this is a, good time to mention a word that I don't use often enough. I don't think we've said it here, but but love. Now, this was a young woman who hadn't been thinking about a child at all, but then met someone who uh, she fell in love with and just suddenly she wanted a baby. It was just the most natural, surprising instinct. Before that, I, I don't think she necessarily would have said that was going to happen anytime soon. So sometimes we can't overprocess these things, you know, without when you meet that right partner and someone, okay, we're both on the same page to create a child together. I think something changes that, you know, we we can't overanalyze, that we can't, you know, make part of some science project in some way. Um, so maybe we've lost the idea. You know, the idea today, I mean, I was just thinking about this. If, you know, people are having children, the most common age to have a child these days in most developed countries is in your early 30s. That might be your second or third child for some. It might be the first for others. But that's the most popular period where people are having a child. And, you know, for those having a first child in their early 30s, you've been dating for 10 plus years and you've probably had several partners. So the idea, you know, going back to someone who is early 20s now that, okay, I don't want a child yet to my 30s. We got 10 years of dating to get through. Are you going to fall in love with someone during that time? Probably. But are you going to deny yourself being in love with something, someone, the idea of actually creating a child together? Well, very probably because in today's world, it's not the coolest thing to do. You've got your career and you've got your education. So why even let those desires come to the surface? And then you get into your 30s and maybe you're a little bit tired of love or maybe you've had breakups and it's just not the same anymore. So, you know, this is outside my expertise, but I can clearly see how we've become detached from the concept of wanting a child from simply being in love with someone, which, you know, should, I think, be one of the most, <laughs> you know, important reasons for, for, for happening. So, yeah, when I hear about artificial wombs and technology and pods and whatever else, it's like, as you say, completely the wrong direction. I think it's a beautiful point. Um, we try to over-intellectualize a lot of things and things that go beyond critical thinking or figuring out like it's it resonates on like a a different frequency and often that's love and it's inexplicable and there there was this article and I think it was like a New York was it New York Post I don't know it was one of those tabloids and it had um like this baby making a face and it said our is having a baby worth it and I'm like well if you're asking that you're probably yeah. not in a position to become a parent because it's yeah. not something that you take it's it's like contribution and it's love and it's giving and um to like see it as a like a justifiable means to an end was just so backwards to me and I think we do that a lot it's like is this thing justified is it worth it and it's like some things are worth doing simply because of love and and you know I I, I may forgive the journalist who wrote that because the world we live in, we hear messages like this um, where you know, I've seen the cost of a child being quantified. I've, yeah. I've had people recite that to me. You know, how did we ever get to a point of costing out a child? You know, it's it's like, oh, if it was just, you know, a few hundred dollars less expensive, I might consider it, you know, a couple of thousand less, <sighs> less and I'd definitely do it. It's crazy to think this way. That's not what family, life, love is about. But it's back to, to these well, these voices out there who simply, for whatever agenda they have, are trying to persuade people to have fewer children or no children. And it might be the environment. It might be some form of you know feminism that they think, oh, this is empowerment. But they're not being direct with their argument. They're not being honest with anyone. They're trying to fool people. And one of the ways is by having a headline like that, that, that 
children are only a commodity and the cost is too high. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd that we've been pulled into that way of thinking. Well, I highly recommend everyone check out your documentary, the, at least the first part that's available. It was really incredible. Do you have plans on where you're going to distribute the second, third part um, and like a timeline for that? I'm quite excited because being in here in, in Japan, only Japan, the uh, the major broadcaster here is airing a one hour special about it. And then it's going to cinema release in spring next year here. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to happen everywhere. Uh, we are in conversations in a number of different countries. Uh, no one in the U.S. yet. So if there is a distributor out there, um, what I've said, however, is that um, part of the documentary will be free for educators forever. I'm not going to sell, sell the rights to uh, Netflix and you know, have them take control and distribute it where they want, when they want, or frankly, bury it if they want. So any educator anywhere in the world will have access to up to a one-hour version of this to show in their classrooms. Uh, that's why I did this uh, entire project, for so that younger people can become more informed. So, um, you know, anyone can contact me with any thoughts on that regard. But but otherwise, you know, part one is free and uh, our website, birthgap.org, will have more information in terms of what's happening with the other two parts. Incredible. Um, is there anything else you'd like to plug? Where can people follow you? How can they support you and keep up with you? Um, this is like your time to shamelessly plug away and then we'll make sure we link well, everything below as well. Yeah, and everything I'm doing at the moment really is, you know, it's a social impact organization, the documentaries, nonprofits. So I, I do appreciate support. You, you can make donations there, but that's not what it's about. On birthgap.org, there's quite a community. Several thousand people are on there posting comments and updating news stories from around the world and debating that. Uh, many people might find that interesting. There's a lot of information on there. I'm I'm on, well, it's not Twitter anymore. It's X, isn't it? So you can find yeah. me, Stephen, Stephen J. Shaw, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-J Shaw. Um, yeah, contact me there. And if you want to contact me personally on the birthgap.org website, you can direct message me. I try to respond to everybody there. Well, wonderful. I think your work is so impactful. I'm so glad you're doing it. Everyone, please go check out that documentary. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Candice. I enjoyed it. And that's it for this week's episode of Chatting with Candice. Before you take off, leave that five-star review. If you did it and it's been a while, you can do it multiple times. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. And to support the podcast, please check out the sponsors affiliates and the Buy Me a Coffee link below. I'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.